Yes, today is Pentecost, the 50 days after Easter, right? The day that the Holy Spirit is given to the church. And as I told the, the children up here, the word breath, Jesus breathes on the disciples. And for those of you who don't know, in both biblical Hebrew and biblical Greek, the word, it's not the same in both languages, but the word in both languages means wind, breath, and spirit. I don't think that's a coincidence that it happened in both languages, that the same word means the exact same thing. Jesus breathed on the disciples. The word used here in John is emphaso. Emphaso. Emphazema. See where we get the word from? Actually, this is the only time this word ever occurs in the New Testament. It actually is the word for breath is used in other places because there is another word for breath. But this word is, this is the only time it occurs in John and all of the New Testament. It's actually the same word that is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 where God breathes the breath of life into the nostrils of the man that he just created out of the dust. And he becomes a living being. It's also the exact same word used in Ezekiel chapter 37. Does anybody know what Ezekiel chapter 37 is? The dry bones, right? Oh, you, O oh Lord, are the only one that can make this happen. And he speaks. And the breath of God comes out on the dry bones and they start to rattle and come back to life. It's also used in the book of wisdom in chapter 15 where God's breath is breathed into the living spirit of everything. There's one thing that we have to remember this morning in our reading. All of this happened without whom? Who's not there? No, Jesus is there because Jesus breathed on them. He said, peace be with you. He entered the locked room, right? They were in the gospel of John. After Mary went to the tomb, the disciples are in the locked room. And, they, and Jesus comes in, stands in the middle of them. He says, peace be with you. And then he does this. But who is not there? Kurt? Thomas is not there. So how does Thomas get the Holy Spirit? Right? Jesus just gave him the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say later when, when Jesus comes in and Thomas is there that he breathes on him again and says, receive the Holy Spirit again. It doesn't happen. Thomas isn't there. So how did Thomas get the Holy Spirit? How did you get the Holy Spirit? Some say it happens right here. When you get baptized, and Martin Luther would even say that at baptism you receive the Holy Spirit. However, there are biblical witnesses against that. There's actually people in Acts who have received the Holy Spirit and the disciples talk about, well, what is it just to keep them from being baptized with water then? Since we know that they have already received the Spirit. So the Spirit doesn't come at baptism. Plus, I don't like that idea because that puts God into a box. It puts God into our box and says, God, you're going to do things the way that I want you to do them, the way that they have to happen, the way that makes sense to me. Right? That's not the way God works. That's absolutely not the way that God works. So how do we get the Holy Spirit? There's an answer that comes from our reading today, though. Right? One answer that comes from the Gospel of John today is it comes... When we are sent. Right? It comes when we are sent. Because what changed here? The disciples are locked and fearful, hiding behind doors. Too afraid to go out into the world to tell everybody what was happening. And then Jesus comes in and says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. What changed these 10 men and whoever else was with them to be the most bold proclaimers of something that the world did not want to hear or believe? One answer is that they had seen the resurrection of Jesus, right? The 10 of them saw Jesus stand in front of them. They saw the holes in his hands. They saw the, the spear mark in his side. And that changed them. But did you see the resurrected Jesus? See, actually, I could say that's a trick question because I could tell you to turn and look at the person sitting next to you. And technically, that is Jesus because Jesus lives in each and every one of us. But no, you haven't. I have not. 
In the life and bodily form, I have not seen my Lord and Savior stand before me and seen the holes in his hands, which actually weren't in his hands. They were down here. Um, we haven't seen that. The thing that changed these 10 men and all the women and everybody else who was with them is the fact that Jesus breathed on them. Jesus sent them to go out into the world as God the Father sent him here to show us how to live. Jesus then turned around and sent the rest of them out, giving them the power of the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, to go with them and to be with them and to show them everything that they needed to do. He gave them the Spirit. The Spirit comes after the disciples have been commissioned to do the work that Jesus came to do. They are the continuation, as we are the continuation of what Jesus came to do. The purpose of this resurrection appearance here in John is not so much to prove that there was a resurrection, but it is for Jesus to send the disciples as he himself was sent here. Easter is not just coming to a wonderful, inspiring worship service. It's being sent back out into a hostile world, empowered by the Holy Spirit, bearing witness to the identity of who God is, revealed to us, and who Jesus was. You see, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. And to completely understand this, maybe we need to understand the patronage system of Jesus' day. The patronage system was set up where there was three different levels of people. Right? There were three characters in this system. Then the first one was the patron, the man or the person who had all of the power, who controlled all of the resources, who, is, who was the king or the governor or the whoever, the person who had the power over everyone else in the region. They're expected to use their position to hand out favors to inferiors based on friendship, personal knowledge, or favoritism. Benefactors or patrons were expected to generously support the villages, cities, or the clients to whom they were patron over, right? And throughout all of the New Testament, we see God as the ultimate patron. The second player in this system is called the broker. The broker is the mediator between the patron and the person, the people that the patron is sovereign over, the clients. The first order resources are all controlled by patrons. Patrons control land, they control jobs, they control goods, they control funds, they control all of the power. And the second order resources are controlled by the mediator, the broker. These are strategic contact with the patron. If you want to see the patron as a client, you've got to go through the broker. Access to the patron. If you want to have access to the patron, you have to go through the broker. The broker is the one who mediates the goods and service that the patron is offering the clients. And this is clearly the role that John sets up for us for Jesus, right? The person who is mediating between us and God. Jesus is our broker. Jesus says, you are from below and I am from above. John is clearly setting up the fact that Jesus is the middleman. Trust me, he doesn't stay there. It's all okay. We'll get to the point where he moves out of that position. He also makes it clear that the patron, God the Father, has given his resources to the Son to distribute as Jesus will distribute them. The Father loves the Son and has placed all things in his hands. And then the third player in all of this is the client, right? Those who are dependent upon the patron and the broker to give them the things that they need. They are dependent upon the gracious patron or brokers to survive all of life. They owe loyalty and public acknowledgement and honor in return for everything that is given to them. And the patron, the patronage was voluntary, but ideally lifelong, meaning and once you had a patron, you stayed with that patron. You didn't move around. You didn't jump around. You didn't patron shop, right? You didn't do those kind of things. You stuck with the person who was good to you and gave you the things that you needed. Having only one patron to whom you owed total loyalty had been the pattern in Rome from the earliest times. But in more chaotic competition for clients and patrons in the outlying provinces, playing patrons off against one another became somewhat commonplace. Right? In the Roman society of Jesus' day, it was, it was okay for you to skip that system over and say... I don't like what this patron's doing, so I'm going to try to get another one. Play them off against each other. In the New Testament, the language of grace is a language of the patron system. God is seen as the ultimate patron whose resources are graciously given and often mediated through Jesus. 
Jesus, John commented on Jesus. He said that Jesus only spoke or acted the way that God the Father told him to do it, right? Jesus said, all the things that I say to you, I have heard from the Father. And all the things I do for you or to you, I have gotten from the Father to do. Jesus never did anything on his own, but did what the patron, God the Father, wanted him to do. Besides the image of God as patron giving to Jesus, the broker who gives to the disciples, the clients. Throughout John, Jesus is the one who is sent. Right. Remember, the broker is the one who mediates between the patron and the client. He is the one that goes from the patron to the clients to give them what they need or from the clients to the patron to get what the clients need. Jesus is sent in the Gospel of John 43 times in the Gospel of John. We are told that Jesus was sent by God 43 times. This is language that only truly appears in the Gospel of John. Only twice in the Gospel of Matthew is Jesus sent from God. Only once in the Gospel of Mark. Only four times in the Gospel of Luke. And only once ever in all of the writings of Paul. 43 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus is sent out into the world to go from God to be with the people. And this scent belongs to the vocabulary of the patron system. Jesus is sent as a broker from the patron, God our Father, to give to the clients, the disciples, everything that they need. The sent messenger is the one that is beholden by the patron. He's the one that's held in high esteem by the patron as his contact with his clients. He acts as the intermediary between the patron and those for whom the message is intended. That is, he acts as broker. broker. Right? He's the mediator, the broker. He's the one who gives everything from the patron to the clients. This is a role Jesus plays throughout the Gospel of John. Note that eight times also in the Gospel of John, 43 times Jesus is sent, and eight times in the Gospel of John we're reminded that Jesus is going back to the patron. Right? Chapter 7, verse 33, chapter 13, chapter 14, twice, chapter 16, four times. We're told that Jesus is going back to God. So not only does he come from God, but he goes to God, right? That broker, that mediator position, he is going back and forth, suggesting that the broker has ready access to and from the patron who sent him. Eventually, what happens here this morning in our reading in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus will turn over the broker role to his former clients. The disciples, the 10, now become the middlemen who will take up the role of broker on Jesus' behalf. As you, have, as you have sent me into the world, God, now I have sent them into the world. So how did Thomas get the Spirit? How did Thomas get the Spirit? Yeah, he could have got it from the other disciples. He was also sent by Jesus. Just like us, we're sent. See, Jesus didn't say to only the ten that were in that room that morning. This reading was given so that we can remember it and know that Jesus not only sent the ten, but he sent each and every one of you as well. Jesus came to send us. To be his hands and his feet. To be the brokers of God the Father's graces to all of the world. Just as it says over the doors, if you haven't noticed them, look up as you go out of the building today. The signs over the door say it very clearly. As you leave this place, you go to do service. Because we are called to be God's hands and feet. To be the mediator, the brokers of the grace that God has given to us. To a world that so desperately needs to hear that they are loved by the patron, the ultimate patron, God the Father. So go into the world empowered by the Spirit, filled over and over again with God's power and love, just like the balloon is, to show everyone the love that He first showed to you.